Hey, what's up you guys? How's it going? This is a quick jump on pop-up stream for you guys. We're going live on YouTube um, in a slight vacation time and I'm not home right now at the moment, which while well, you probably hear some background noise here and there, uh, but I am going to sketch a little bit for you guys and also do some card opening breaks and uh, we'll see how things kind of go. Um, of course, you know, if anybody then has any questions and stuff like that, you guys are welcome to try to ask and I'll try to get to you guys as soon as possible. Uh, but if anybody has, um, like I said, questions that pertain to things like education, arts, and materials, I welcome generally all. Uh, but for now, uh, before I actually go a bit further into the sketching and drawing, uh, I'm actually going to be doing some card breaks. And uh, I, I like to do this just because it's something that I like to do as an association to like a hobby of interest. Um, because these are things I just love to kind of like get into. You know, there's uh, um, an aspect of it that kind of puts you in a mindset of ease, but, you know, uh, attention and interest of things. Even the subject matter itself could be kind of like, you know, a bit inspirational towards developing ideas of visual things on the page. So, of course, you know, I certainly don't mind uh, just jumping straight into the sketch for myself personally. Um, but, you know, I definitely don't mind having an excuse to be able to fall into the hobbies of interest of things that I have, uh, which is why I use this time for that. So uh, we will be opening up some cards, and I have a, three packs here, which are coming from an upper deck. Uh, this is from the 90s. This is a 92-93 season, so I'm looking for, for specific Jordan cards in this one. Uh, I also have another pack over here, which I'll open up. Um, this is a little bit smaller in terms of how many there are. But uh, we'll see how many people we get in today. Um, I'm sure there's going to be just a, a handful here and there. But uh, again, thanks for uh, joining in. And also happy next evening to those of you in the States. International people, hope you guys are having a good week and relaxing and having a moment to yourself as well, even though it's middle of the weekdays. Um, but anyways, I'm going to open up a few of these for now. I only brought a couple of sleeves. I have a pack of penny sleeves, so hopefully it'll take me uh, all the way through to the end. Um, but again, I'm here to like interact, ask, you know, answer questions, um, talk with you guys, chat, and a little bit like that. I'm on vacation right now. I'm in San Diego, so um, family, friends, and stuff like that rented a, a house, which is why we're out here right now. And I am just relaxing, uh, and I figured I would sketch and just open some cards. So, in here again, I'm I'm looking for specifically the Jordan cards. So we'll see if we pick up any here. Um, I gotta flip some of these. Looks like. I've already actually opened up uh, a good several number of packs already based on these sets. And um, we'll see if I hit on anything. I'm looking for a couple of specific things. We'll see if we find it. Hopefully you guys are having a nice time just kind of relaxing. Um, I'll get to maybe a little bit of sketching a bit at the end of this whole session. I do have my accordion book. And I also do have my uh, large sketchbook, so we'll see what I use. I do also have my ST DuPont pen, which somebody had asked about last time. Um, and so I might bring this in as a part of sketching and drawing as of today. And we'll see how it works. Sometimes that pen can be a little bit iffy. Other times it can be pretty good. So we actually have a hollow card here. It's reflecting the phone. But this is, looks like, you no, know, David Robinson. Hollow cards can be really hard to grade. Uh, Quality-wise can be hard to check. But I'll keep this up to the size. Surface-wise, it looks a little bit, eh, a couple of small dents here and there, but pretty normal. So I'm going to have to flip through these a little bit quickly, because I'm not going to hang up on any specific player right now, except for just some of the Jordan for the 92, 93 season. Uh, as again, you guys are joining in. For those of you who are welcome to ask questions, interact in any way. Hopefully the audio is okay enough. Uh, I am in, in a location in the living room, so there are other people out there. So I don't want to be overly loud uh, in conversing with you guys. Oh, nice. The bowl. If I can isolate a few rookie cards in here later on, I'll go through them in a bit more detail. And we'll see what we get. So we got one hollow card in that one. That's interesting. Audio is good? Okay, that's fine. Just wanted to make sure, because on the phone, usually the audio picks up pretty well. And uh, welcome for those of you that joined in. It's a draft card right there. That one I might put off to the side, rookie on that one. Nice magic. And again, I'm pretty much going to go through these pretty quickly here in these particular packs. The other one, I might take my time a little bit. Just 
Maybe I'll do an intermittent sketch in between before we get to the other box. Nothing really uh, standing out here just yet. Like I said, I'm going to go into these in more detail later on. Okay, let's do one last one. Do I do collectible cars that come with bubble, uh, bubble gum? Um, do they even do that anymore? I don't even know. Magic cards, I don't really open. Um, I like the art for it. I have a lot of friends who work in the industry that work for uh, Wizards of the Coast. And so they do a lot of that kind of artwork for the covers and, and not covers, but for the trading cards themselves. Not even trading cards, playing cards. Um, I've worked with that company beforehand, uh, Wizards of the Coast, but I did mostly design. Design of characters, creatures, that kind of thing. It's a nice collector's choice art piece. It's like three magics right there. Nice. Cliff. And again, you guys um, will be able to take advantage of the time with me, mainly because I don't expect a lot of people. Checklist, and I think that's going to almost do it. I'm not expecting anything much out of these packs in particular. Okay. Yeah, these ones. <clears throat> out of the other three that I opened, those actually had some good hits, but these ones in particular, it's alright, we'll put them aside. I'm going to sleeve this one up, and then uh, we will go into a, a bit of the sketching. Well, I'm going to actually put the live chat on. Yeah, and again, welcome, Jay Ducker, Lee, how are you guys? There's a Robinson Hollow. Okay. <clears throat> so I figured while we're doing that, uh, while we're also opening cards, we could be going through some sketching here. I was actually going to wrap up on one of them. On the back end. This was still in the mid process. I haven't finished this one just yet, but I might come back to that later. Obviously, we started on the other side, going into the mechanical stuff, vehicles, and whatnot. Um, I think I might want to do something a little bit more. I don't know about educational is the right word, but it's something that you can actually kind of follow along with me if you want to. So, this is the SD DuPont pen, um, something I wouldn't recommend for most people because uh, the price range on this one is not going to be affordable. Uh, I myself am borrowing the pen, just testing it out. This is a, a rollerball pen. So it's got an inner cartridge like this in it. Rollerball. It's not a ballpoint. Uh, those use different kinds of cartridges and inks. But this is like a gel. Uh, the kind of tools that I have been using this one a lot. Uh, this one is the um, Kuretake brush pen. So this one has a pretty thick base on it. And also a thin tip. This is the one I've been using for a lot of these really big canvas uh, illustrations. And the recent one from the Monkey King was using these ones, the Pentel brush pens. These are a little bit too heavy for this sizing of the paper right now. Uh, if I was to go to this dimension using a brush pen, I'd probably turn to this one here. This is also the Pentel brush pen, but this has a gray transparent cap, uh, gray handle, and is much finer uh, brush. So this one could be a bit more useful for those that are looking for a finer point. But brush pens I wouldn't recommend in the beginning anyways for anybody. And the chat for some reason is disappearing. Uh, there we go. You know, I was asked by uh, Marvel to do some uh, trading card stuff recently, but I turned it down or just didn't really, really, didn't really respond, mainly because uh, the pay just wasn't equivalent to the amount of work they're looking for. Okay, let's see here. 
So as an accordion book, I can kind of open it up like this. Um, and I think I'm gonna start in this region on this particular page. What I'll usually do is in an accordion book is I'll go through page like uh, page by page like this in the actual rig of the book. But there are certain regions in between at the spine where then of course, if I open it up, I can then fill in some of the gaps in between. Um, gap spaces can be just filled in with any kind of illustration. Like I just put a random shark back there, right? So it doesn't really matter what the subject is. Uh, it's more, more based on just kind of using visual information to kind of transition images from left to right. Uh, so I'll just start on the inside page over here, starting on this side and working my way through this direction. I'm gonna kind of tilt the sketchbook so you can kind of see it better. Uh, tap tank, Tata tank is saying you got your first fountain pen yesterday. Got the Majan Moon, Moon Man fountain pen. That's good to hear that writes well. I've never heard of that brand or never used it before, but if it's a, a good pen, that's awesome to hear. Sorry again, the chat window keeps disappearing on me. I don't know if there's a way to keep it permanently on. I'm not seeing an option, but. So Jay Decker was asking, what are my thoughts on quantity versus quality when practicing? Would doing 130 second gestures be more beneficial than doing one one hour drawing? Would I ideally want to balance between the two? Balancing between the two is good, but actually I would side a little bit more to the quantity aspect of it. Quality will always come in time, but no matter what, the sense of quality will always want to be improved on. Because no matter how much experience you have, you're always going to feel like, ah, oh, this is not good, this is bad, this is not really working well. So you're never really fully satisfied. And it's not supposed to be at that point where you hit that level of like, okay, I'm done now. There's no more growth, you know? Uh, so it never kind of ends at that point. So I think focusing on more of mileage, quantity, uh, continues the increasement of quality naturally over time. So instead of focusing on ideally only the expectation of finish, uh, going into just the process of actually enjoying doing what you're doing naturally invokes the actual quality gain from there. So I would rather focus on you doing like, you know, in a week, 100 to 200 sketches, um, you know, kicking up that mileage, making sure your discipline, rhythm, um, you know, understanding the tool sets and, you know, exploring different, you know, subject matter gives you the ability to not draw in highest of quality and details and finesse, but to be able to also you know, move things in space and turn them in different directions. And let's say if I'm drawing this tank again, like I can draw from the side view to the front view to three quarter views, whatever the case is. So even if you are just building primitive forms, cubes and cylinders and stuff like that, it's not about trying to draw the thing as it is. It's about being able to understand it through its internal form and then being able to, you know, harness it as a, as a uh, retention of memory to, for, for full control. Yeah, the carrot cake. A tank. Uh, Lee's saying you use the zebra pens. You have um, refill cartridges and a bit cheaper. Yeah, the zebra pens are actually pretty good. Uh, I, I mainly used the ballpoint pens back in the day when I was a student for the uh, zebra ballpoint pens, but I haven't really used anything else from there. So what we're going to do with this one uh, a little bit differently than s s something like this, where it kind of has that, where this piece kind of shows you the precursor to this one. And I'll do somewhat of a similar thing, but with a bit more of an evolutionary process. So kind of think of it that way. I don't know exactly what we're gonna draw just yet, but we're gonna start over here. I'm gonna work my way down this direction, down to about this region of area, and that'll be where the kind of finalization where it's gonna go. Up into the top corners over here. So imagine this being basically like an A4 size piece of paper, eight up by 11. So kind of put it horizontally. If you're sketching with me, just kind of think about where you wanna put your sketches first. So planning things of, of movement and placement is something to really also incorporate as a practice because a lot of you guys will just kind of choose a spot and sketch and choose a spot and sketch and it becomes very kind of random and sporadic. The um, best thing to do is always just start with a primitive form. As always, let's just use something like this where we're going to use like a cube. Um, I'm trying to think of what we'll end up sketching, maybe something that is kind of based in marine life or maybe like a character as well too. Um, maybe some kind of like mech type character. But what I want is basically just one cube form. So I'm going to bring it a little bit closer to the camera. So why did I draw this cube? Uh, this cube is going to represent a certain region of like a character type. And I'm already thinking of like a character that's maybe uh, I don't know, some kind of soldier or mecha, you know, cybernetic kind of guy. And as I go down this direction, I, I might even at this point already build a few more elements about him. 
uh, and then go down this direction and add more refinement of the pieces of, let's say, anatomy or uh, clothing structures and posing and whatnot. But I'm going to keep these all very similar. And before we move on, the cube itself, uh, instead of trying to drawing that out of your head, I'd recommend you guys using actual references. So don't, you know, look at the surface of this uh, packaging, but imagine this as being just a cube, right? So instead of trying to make it up, look at the actual thing and saying, okay, I have a certain angle of view, there's that line, there's this line going that direction, there's that line going that direction, going down this way. And in this particular use of the camera lens, because it's a wide angle lens, it kind of gives you a three point perspective. You can see the convergence is going down that direction, convergence is going that way, convergence is going that way. So this box or cube can be representative of that one from a slightly different angle, maybe more from like the side to the top, like that. So using actual visual guides is something I'll recommend. Uh, let's build a bit more. Uh, what I'm gonna do here is put another cube on the top plane here. As I go down this direction, Let's use different kinds of forms now. Let's use a sphere. This will represent the shoulder region. Now, you, of course, you can draw through. You can use pencils. You can use ballpoint and draw through the whole thing. So you can kind of, you know, overlay stuff. This would be his upper arm. The shoulder is going to be over there. Now, I don't recommend everybody draw the human form every single time like this. I'm doing this mainly because I also am thinking visually of the way it's going to progress evolutionary-wise. For, for a lot of my figure drawing kind of classes, I actually start with things like torsos using pillowcase designs and lines only and draw through and connections and then build form around it. I wouldn't necessarily go directly to the form like this one as a practice towards student work. So you guys can obviously use a lot of underlay, uh, line work, gesture, that kind of stuff uh, to better help you to capture what you're trying to go for. Let's go down this direction. Let's turn the hips a bit further. So that line right there, that was supposed to be this corner here, but I shifted it. So this pen's okay. It's a, it's a little bit, it skips slightly um, on this textured watercolor paper. So I might transition to a different pen in just a moment. Once I finish up here with this one, I'll, I'll switch it over. Because his left arm will come this direction, I'm going to have his right leg coming forward this way. So when we run, you know, we kind of have the striding actions. We go, let's say we're running and we, we lift our right arm, then our left leg comes forward. It kind of creates that contrast to balance. So the left leg will go down this way. Let's have the other arm going back this direction. Maybe it'll be some kind of sport, you know, um, character mechanized thing. And we're literally just building cubes and forms. So that kind of thing right there, that would be draw through. So you're literally seeing the sphere overlapping the cylinder and I'm drawing through it to make sure the accuracy of the sphere is there. You can also just suggest it. Going down this direction, as you can see now, also the scale change from large down to small, large to small, and that can be played with uh, to the degree or level that you want to, and you can play with an experiment with it, so you can go larger and then smaller, and that changes that foreshortened approach even more, and this is slightly foreshortened, but not super heavily, uh, and you can go much more overlapped where the camera angle could be more up top, and you can open up a lot more things and push your scale much larger, and that will give you extreme foreshortening. So there's a, a you know a simple walking guy uh, built with cubes. I like to use these kind of cross contour lines that center the form. But we're gonna switch pens real quickly. It's all right, but. That's one I use is this one here. Uh, this is a recent find. Uh, this is a company that I don't know of. Uh, called, <clears throat> called the Magic Pen, obviously Japanese. Uh, I found it at a stationery store, but I don't really know much about it, but I know it's a, a relatively nice pen. 
It has a uh, fine nib, felt tip. And I've been playing with it a little bit. And it's a pretty nice line. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is off to this side over here. I'm gonna rebuild this guy, okay? And give it just a little bit more clarity of information of details, all right? So let's put his head up here. And again, this is gonna be some kind of like walking, um, cybernetic, <clears throat> mechanical kind of guy kind of thing. So because I can generate visuals or designs of any type I want to, meaning that the actual mechanical elements here, I'm just making up, it's fantasy. So of course I have memory of things like mechanical forms and details and constructions of things, uh, but I don't necessarily need to actually uh, draw them realistically because this is fantasy again. So what we'll do, <clears throat> let's put his head up here again. Uh, you know what? Let's actually draw it real lightly as a primitive form. In fact, in fact if anything else, let's just rebuild it. because I think this will be more of an evolutionary type of drawing if I incorporate uh, most of everything that I had just done. As I do so, these, this cube right here, which represents that part, which is the head, I can go back into this now and basically do what we call the cutaway method. So we cut into it. Cut, cut, cut. and start adding these components of information and details. Now, of course, again, uh, to simply just take that primitive form and adding details of design uh, isn't gonna be the easiest thing to do. So what do you do in this situation? As you build a form like this one here, look at things like actual designs of characters um, from comics, animations, games that you like, and pull from that inspiration to plug into here. So have something you can look at also too. You don't have to make this up out of your head. I don't expect you to, nor should you yourself. Um, so look at stuff that give you the inspiration to move it to the next thing. But let's keep adding more. So his shoulder's going to be up here now again. In the secondary drawing, I can also readjust his pose and readjust scale and proportion. And because this is still at an early stage of development, I'm not really worried if this is like a perfectly drawn thing because I'm going to take this information and do one more iteration over here. And in this iteration, we'll then go maximum detail. So I'm just going to make things up now. So this is kind of like an upper collar piece, goes into the back area. We'll have the arm coming out this direction. We'll add things like hydraulics and joints. And again, I'll still build some primitive forms lightly and then add to it. Let's have this arm over here coming out that direction. Same thing, building the same form, cylinder, cylinder. And we are now actually adding more details around the mid region now. And even though it's mechanical, it doesn't have to be so um, engineeringly perfect. Uh, if anything else, it actually retains a lot of organic elements for myself in terms of how I like to do things when it comes to mechanics. Because um, I'm pulling from the information of anatomy of how things of you know, muscles and articulation and works and then converting them into more mechanical like stuff, right? So hard metals and panel pieces and wires and gears and joints and pistons and whatnot. And those kind of things can give you the interpretation or at least the idea that it's some kind of mechanical thing. At this point, I'm still looking at it and wondering, like, you know, what do I want to change? Do I like about it? Do I not like about it? And then, you know, I'll make those decisions and I go to the next thing. 
Now, do I do this all the time? Uh, for illustrations that I do in my sketches, not necessarily, uh, but for design work, I definitely do go through a lot of iteration and process. Uh, something that, you know, I'm sure people don't fully understand when it comes to things like, you know, when people draw like Superani, you know, everyone assumes that there, everyone just, just goes in there, draws straight in, you know, so it doesn't mean that those people don't necessarily spend the time to also practice and, uh, you know, generate these kinds of iterations of process. So again, if you're following along and sketching with me, uh, you can be building some kind of mechanical dude. Uh, I built primitive forms initially over here. We're repeating this pose and bringing it onto the side. As you can see, I'm still building a few elements of indications to help me along and as to like what the form looks like. And then converting that information interior-wise with details and things I'm just making up. Now, as I make them up, it doesn't mean it's coming up from nowhere. A lot of it is from the memories of things that I've seen in the past. Things like military machines, vehicles, uh, other mechs, you know, other designs or other artists work. And that helps me move forward to be able to develop these kind of visuals quickly and confidently. Let's go down to the hips over here. Uh, for the hips <clears throat> and down to the, to the lower portion, I'm just going to give them pants. We'll just kind of go easy. And you're going to see, again, like more wires and gears and stuff like that. But he's just going to wear like a ripstop pants or something like that. Uh, Tata Tank is saying you found this magic pen on Amazon uh, for $18 for a 10-pack. So again, we're going to have the bottom hip portion coming down this way. Now I can still build internally. Primitive forms, and because we kind of bulked up the arm and I slightly repositioned it, it's overlapping now the leg. And I like this a little bit better because I like overlaps a lot. These are obviously kind of like next to each other, right here, the arm and the leg. So it kind of creates a parallel here to here. But with this one, I have an overlap on top of the leg, which gives you a better sense of depth. And I'll have the leg over here coming out more straight. And this leg would be bent. So you're kind of lightly constructing but at this point even as a secondary sketch i'm still kind of playing around <clears throat> getting a sense of like what i like but because he's also wearing pants he's going to have the material kind of like stretching creasing folding on top of the form. So I lift this up for you a little bit. As you go down to the foot and the ankles, I'll place in a few more touches of mechanical elements and I'll design some kind of like, you know, boot or foot that resembles some of the elements up here. And I mirror things, you know, I grab stuff from this and I bring it down to this one. Right now, there can be, this is a little bit physically straining because the phone is directly in my face right now. So I'm leaning over to the right to kind of look at where I'm actually even going. Uh, what I'm even trying to do is draw uh, as I'm looking at the phone, which I think could be really hard. But I'm going to try it. So what I'm doing right now is I'm sketching while I'm looking at my phone screen. I'm not looking at the paper. Uh, this is kind of hard because I can't see where everything is. <laughs> So, um, question here is, overlaps or clear silhouette? Which one would you prefer? Both. Overlaps and a clear silhouette. Yes, this is a much more um, informative silhouette of the independent limbs that are individually there. And that because of the overlap, there are certain regions of negative space that doesn't exist. But the overlap of facial detailing can give you that much more information of, of depth, but also, again, allows us to, to retain a clear silhouette of the line around the shape of the thing. So it's still recognizable as a human form. You don't lose that, even though we have overlap here from this one over here. Uh, I prefer this though. And this is something I've always struggled with in the past. For instance, like if I go to this spot here, like do I preemptively plan overlaps and stuff like this? Uh, sometimes and sometimes not. 
Other times I'm already kind of preemptively moving that direction. I'm able to execute it. Other times I'm just drawing it. It just happens to be that way. Beef Boss is asking, uh, in the past you have said you had this habit of not drawing the lower part of the body. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious if that's something you still catch yourself on. No, I pretty much have completely gotten away from it <laughs> in a lot of ways. Unless it's intentionally gone that way, right? It's not because it's out of accident or because I'm not mentally thinking of it. Um, these days, I don't necessarily run into that kind of problem. It's not even a problem. It's more of like a habit, right? As you, as you just mentioned. Uh, Kat uh, had a question, is this the accordion sketchbook? It is. So if you open it up a bit more, this is what some of the live stream we had done in the past already, the tanks and the vehicles. And I've opened up the second page, which is now starting with these forms, going to the pose of the character. And I'm starting with this kind of orientation so you can see it better. But what I'll do in the future is any of these negative spaces, I'll fill them up with more stuff. And it can be related to this or it can be related to that. I then blend them together, blend them at the spine. So the, in terms of working with the accordion book, uh, going that direction is probably best because you would go with a spread first, like this one, which is self-contained in the frame. And then this one is self-contained in the frame. And then in between it, I would open it up and fill those gap spaces. That helps with the transition as you open up the entire, entire accordion, which can be impressive to people. But it's a simple trick. Other questions here? Sorry. Jay Decker, you're asking if I was able to hit the uh, Amon Manier's, the fours, the Jordan releases. I actually did hit them on the uh, release day, the first release day. The restock today I didn't hit on. Sneakers app I didn't hit on. But on the official uh, website on the first release, I did hit. Gabriel's asking, what does people mean by drawing the silhouette before structure? Silhouette is two-dimensional, a shape. Structure can be three-dimensional form. So I'm going to take this study, I'm going to move it over here, and I'm going to kind of repeat this sketch in the drawing. But this time, we are not going to build a form. We're going to go directly into drawing the details of things. So we'll start right about up here. And as I'm doing this, I'm already kind of planning like where things will go. Arm goes up this way, that way, down this direction, make it over here, back with it over there. And if it goes off, it's okay, because I can open it up, and we have the accordion page to do more. So let's start up here. And I've been doing this um, because of the preemptive practices that came beforehand. I'm already relatively confident as to what I need to be doing. So the amount of thought that goes into the whole thing now is much less uh, straining, much less uh, physically demanding, mentally demanding, because I already kind of know where things needs to go generally. But I can also openly just move things around. Tent to Tank, thanks for the information, man. Appreciate that. That's the name of the pen and information and details about this specific one, the Magic Pen. This is water-based. Uh, I have used it with um, water-based mediums, and it actually does hold permanently if you let it dry, though. I wouldn't draw with this pen and start using watercolors directly on top because it probably wouldn't work so well. But this one, I'd probably let it sit. What do I think of Adam Smash's design? I think it's pretty cool. Now, of course, I played, um, you know, the, the game, uh, Supper Punk, and I, I got introduced to the character in the game itself. And then the animation did an amazing job, you know, bringing him up. Thanks, Brody. Appreciate that, man. But the uh, Hokusai piece. So what I'm going to do with this one, I'm actually going to play with the manipulation a little bit. What I mean by this is that I'm going to actually distort the portions to be longer to stretch things out. His hand will come up here. 
this arm is gonna be back over here. I'm gonna have the torso come forward a little bit. And then we'll have some of the abdominal sections of articulation and joint structure and the pants that wraps around his waist. Again, we'll have an overlap there. I opened up the negative space a little bit right there. And this will come forward in that direction. The pants will cross over this direction here. And what I'm probably going to have to do is open up the accordion book at some point. And the arm's going to come down this direction. I'm going to stretch that out <clears throat> longer compared to what this is. And it gives you, that elongation kind of gives you that sense of um, movement of motion. Imagine like, like motion blur, you know. Um, question here is, is there any specific subject you are not comfortable drawing? Not so much anymore. Uh, if it's something I'm not that familiar with, I'll still look for references. And within the references, I'm able to understand it relatively well. So there's nothing that I can't necessarily draw. Uh, but it doesn't mean that I remember everything. Question from Sam is, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu uh, legend John Danaher says, anyone can master a skill in five years. Do you think this applies to art? He considered mastery being competitive within the top 0.1%. Um, in a five-year period, competitive, yes. But in full control and confidence, I don't think so. But that doesn't mean that you can't compete and that you can't put yourself into the mix of things. Because if you look at then the college, you know, kind of approach of education, uh, what's a typical kind of runtime for, for college students? You're looking at four years, five years, right? Uh, I went to school myself, you know, if you include Art Center, but also other colleges, probably about a six year period. So I'm gonna take this leg Bring it down this direction and we're also going to stretch this leg out a little bit longer this is just some kind of running form humanoid mech i'm going to use details shadow shapes darks that kind of stuff to push a bit more on top of this guy Like an animation cycle, a little bit, yeah. But this is definitely the, the evolutionary process that I talk about when it comes to sketching and drawing daily, which is, um, you know, people tend to kind of focus on the final result of what it's supposed to look like, but not really focusing enough on repetition practice on how you can build it and then get to that point. Uh, beef, I, uh, boss, I wouldn't say that you know, the whole concept of 10,000 hours and 10 years to become an expert at a subject is not necessarily reliable. I'm sure there are many examples of individuals that have, but I wouldn't rely on it because there is no guarantee that in 10 years with 10,000 hours that you will actually expertly control the skill sets you want. Because to maintain the, the level of confidence and skill that I have right now took me 20 years. <laughs> you know? The, big, the mindset has to be focused on more of are you willing to give any amount of time, no matter how long it takes, to achieve the goals of you know, your uh, perspective of, of goal sets, you know, and, and to be able to uh, not only just retain them, but, but to uh, take advantage of them. Once we get into enough detail information, uh, I'm going to start to hit some darts. In terms of the five-point perspective, Stylies, you you're going to need the horizon line, no matter what. 
and understand first building the 1.2 point, 3 point. Um, 1 point, 2 point is gonna be where you're gonna start with the first, well, three point as well too. Uh, and then be able to actually go, of course, to the four point. And once you understand the four point, you're pretty much there. So built to the four point perspective initially, the fifth vanishing point is right in the center. Red Pirate is asking, uh, you always get discouraged in the blocking out part. I'm, I'm like, there's no way this poorly drawn circle will shape up to be a head. Uh, I need to draw more and listen to the critic less. I mean, yeah, but again, that's the thing is like, that's the whole point of a block out period is just to understand. So it could be poorly drawn or well drawn, but it's to help you at least get to the practice and getting more consistent with it, right? Because you're not going to get it right the first time around. Yeah, Beef Boss is saying that, you know, you have uh, less than one year of experience. So um, if you're unwilling to give your entire lifetime into this you know one year is nothing but then 20 years also it seems a long time but really is nothing either and i would continue doing this into the rest of my life but i understand people want this now I'm like but i have to start working i gotta start competing i gotta start putting together portfolios i gotta be an expert in this kind of thing but that's the wrong mentality again as a student how are you supposed to be expertly crafted in these skill sets uh in, in the things that you're training for no student that i know of who graduated are experts in their skills that they have nor would they even say so and if they did they're just trying to talk themselves up. Um, you're always going to grow, right? So the, the switch to the idea is, are you willing to commit to this because the passion and the interest and the enjoyment for doing it is so strong that it doesn't matter if it takes 10 years, 20 years, or a lifetime to do so? Maddie, when I'm going to do the next Magma Studio is when I go back home. So I'm out, actually out of my house right now. I'm not in my studio, so I'm out, out on vacation with family, friends, and whatnot. So I'm inside the Airbnb doing this. So the next time I go back home, I'll try to start back, uh, back up again. Uh, Jordan Haig is asking, do you have a rough idea of when my dynamic sketching classes will be held next year, or is it something you'll determine closer to the time? I want to say probably mid-January. Mid to, you know, close to the end of January, I would say. Because I'm going to need probably about a couple of weeks in the beginning of January just to kind of obviously take a break, and then we'll go into the latter half. But registration will pop up uh, once around that time. On my Instagram, of course. Thanks for asking, though, man. And as Best Korean Jesus is saying, you know, everyone's focused on how much time it takes instead of enjoying the journey. And that's really what it comes down to. But that's it's easy to say but, and a very difficult thing to do. You know, it sounds simple enough by saying, I should just enjoy this. But a lot of times you can't because you're so concerned and, you know, there's so much risk and time that goes into it. And the impatience is there because you're not seeing the actual result happening. Um, so I understand, you know, everyone at, at certain levels and points are, are, are going to feel that way. I, I mean, I felt that way also. Um, anyways. But that's very true, though, you know. Okay, let's go back to the drawing. So I'm going to go back to this piece down over here. Let's go to the foot. This, you see the way the angle of the foot is? I don't like that as much. I want it downturned more. Overlapped. And this will give it a bit more of a stronger down angle view. This foot's going to disappear behind this figure a little bit. So I'm not concerned about the way it looks. Now I can also, you know, throw in like little kicked up dust that gives you the action of movement. So here we started off with the primitive form. We blocked another one, primitive forms with the details now built underneath it. Now we went straight into the information of detail of the figure. So let's continue focusing on this guy. And what I'm going to do is start knocking in like spaces and pieces in between that are dark. That gives you the illusion of depth, but also in detail. You're also incorporating things like line weight, intricacies of details, but it's an illusion effect. It's not necessarily adding more detail. You're taking what is and just using dark and light to help push things back and forth. Then I isolate in sections in between regions. Top of the head, these panel lines, I'm not a fan of them either too. So I'm gonna either take them out or I'm gonna just kind of keep it more minimal. Minimize, minimize. So the better one is kind of nice and open like that. So Sam is saying, exactly. So it's possible in uh, five, if, if that's all you do and have world-class teachers. I mean, it's kind of what I had. Uh, you know, when I went to college and school, 
I had instructors, you know, that were highly skilled, um, and not just because they were world class, but because they were passionate teachers. You know, they were interested in helping develop people and get to their next steps and in their own careers. Uh, my mentor, Norm, you know, w was an excellent draftsman. Would I say he was the best ever? I mean, of course not, but neither am I. Uh, but I definitely do my damn hardest, you know, to teach people that are in the classes that, that take my class uh, and based, based on my skill set. And I always then recommend others and recommend different pathways because, again, I'm not the one resource for just all the information that you're, that person is going to need. Uh, but I'm also hyper aware of this, you know. Some instructors may not be, and maybe your experience in education may not be as strong, might be a little bit poor based on your interpretation. But hopefully you'll then come across that, you know, kind of overlap of finding someone that can give you that kind of reinforcement and encouragement, but also the, the difficult, that challenging aspect of putting you in a position that's uncomfortable uh, to help you grow, right? But again, easier to find to say uh, than actually doing it. But you do have to put yourself in positions to go uh, have those kind of opportunities to actually intermix in that way. Thank you, Jordan. Appreciate that. Me was asking here this dilemma of clear silhouette or overlap in my illustration, but also draw more and get that milestone. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, but again, there's nothing wrong with having a clear, uh, an open silhouette. And, and of course, you can try to do things that overlaps. The idea is that you have different experimentations to see which ones that you prefer. Just because I say that doesn't mean it's the best way to do it either. Um, go to the things you also like seeing visually. Neff is saying or asking one thing I'm focusing on is anime. It looks uh, to have very specific rules when it comes to it. What do you think of it? Rules in what way though, right? Construction wise, story wise, um, you know, in terms of like the trends and the looks of things, you know, if you can be more specific about that, I'd like to know. Gabriel is saying, you took, your, uh, took my dynamic sketching class last year, and uh, appreciate that. Haven't practiced most of the exercise in a while. Any advice you can give me because I've been doing figure drawing for the last past three months? Well, here's the thing. That's part of the problem of educational pathways that most people take, which is they'll take my dynamic sketching class. It's like, okay, now that's done. And they checklist it, and they say, I'm going to sign up for the next course, which is going to be figure drawing or perspective or whatever the case is. The thing is, all these classes are intertwined together. They go hand in hand. The dynamic sketching class could help you with your figure drawing also, too in terms of building form, understanding the exercises, right? If you did them also while in conjunction with your figure drawing exercise, it may have assisted in some way, potentially. But of course, it's hard to do so because finding the time to incorporate that lesson in the figure drawing lesson can be hard to juggle. But as you progressively go in your education, the idea is that you're supposed to balance and juggle multiple different things, anatomy, proportion, line quality, materials, methods of approach, right? Mentality of thinking. These are singular at first as education, as you are beginning in your educational pathway, but eventually as you continue to mature and experience more things, your ability to endure and balance multiple different aspects have to be continued to grow. But the only way to do so is to practice. But you know, by taking a figure drawing now, it's like, oh, you know, I didn't get to do as much dynamic sketching. You can feel bad about that, but I wouldn't because it's also normal to sometimes leave behind certain things because you don't have the time to incorporate every single thing you wanted to do. So um, you, you start to find your interests. You go to your strengths, things that you like and don't like. And you might say, well, you know, I really like dynamic sketching a lot. Well, then based on that interest, you're going to come back into it. You will find a time to do so. Uh, so as I'm asking, or you're asking me now what, what you could do, uh, you start over. You start from square one. Get back to the exercise while you're still doing the figure drawing stuff now, right? Because you still want to incorporate the practice of balancing. But because dynamic sketching is still somewhat familiar, you may not have practiced as much, but I'm sure you understand it relatively well in terms of what we're supposed to be doing that um, you can jump into it quicker, right? You won't feel as uncomfortable compared to the very first time you took the class, right? And because that discomfort is not as strong as in the beginning, your ability to handle more of that element uh, will be stronger. I hope that makes sense. That's the best explanation I can give in terms of that situation. These are like weird little vent packs and I'm thinking of designs of something on his back over here. Kind of looks like a jet pack in a way. For those of you joining in for the first time, uh, welcome again. We are live streaming here uh, at my vacation place with some family friends in uh, La Jolla, San Diego, area, San Diego region. 
and um, I'm relaxing, but I figured, you know, I'll just jump on for a little bit live stream on my phone. Uh, I did open a little bit of cards earlier. I'm actually gonna open more. Uh, I've been itching to open some of these packs I have, uh, but I, of course, I wanna make sure that we can incorporate a little bit of sketching because of course, many, many of you are here mainly for that. You could probably give two craps about sports cards, but it's something I enjoy. Uh, I do it mainly because it keeps me um, interested. It, it kind of hits those buttons of some th things I enjoy as a hobby, and it, it keeps me integrated and interested and wanting to create even more. Even though it doesn't seem that has a direct connection to it, but in a lot of ways, you can imagine how a pose like this or a different kind of pose could have come from some of the basketball cards or something like that, right? And even if they're not basketball, it could have been like different kind of cards, you know, artist inspirations or different sports or different kind of things. Sorry about the camera shake. Let me double check my battery. We're at 66%. Okay. Sorry, I missed a bunch of questions here. This, the chat doesn't stay up on top. It disappears after a minute. Uh, Brody's asking, who are some of the artists that inspired you? Just name the two. Um, Katsuya Tarada. Tarada is one of my main inspirations as a student of the college years. I would copy him a lot. Then for uh, one of Tarada's main inspirations, which are also one of mine, is Mobius, right? John Gerard. So Beef Boss is asking, you know, where I can take the dynamic sketching class. Yeah, go to my uh, website, peterhanstyleart.com, and you'll find registration information on there. FF420 is asking, observation or, or from imagination? What would you say is more important to practice? Observation, every single time. From the observation fuels the inspiration for imagination. To say I should, you know, I, I, if I ask you to draw something for me from the imagination, if you've never seen something that's similar to it, how would you be able to create it, right? It's a, it's a simple example of, let's design a creature, cre create some kind of animal that doesn't exist. But I said, resemble it to be like a rhinoceros. And if you've never seen a rhinoceros before, You'd be like, I don't know what that animal looks like. What are you talking about? Well, how are you supposed to generate some kind of creative fantasy animal based on a rhinoceros if you've never seen it before, right? Now, I'm not saying that people can't be creative and, and develop interesting abstract shapes and designs of things out of their head, but in most cases, it's going to be fueled by some form of data of information you're taking in. Most of it's going to be coming from visual, but I'm not going to say that that's going to be the only way because human beings obviously experience life in many different directions. Some people could maybe taking inspiration from sound, maybe smell, maybe smell or sound will give you some sort of visual inspiration in your head that makes you want to generate things. I can't deny that, right? I don't do that myself, but I'm sure there are some people in this, you know, billions of people that are in the planet, there could be one that could do it. If anything else, there's probably a lot more that can than we realize using different sorts of tactile experiences. But that also means that living life is really the key, the, the key element on being able to um, harness that side of creativity. If you really want to draw to your mind, imagination, you got to look at more stuff. you got to experience more things. Watch those movies. Read your comics. Play your games. Have your hobbies. Go travel, right? Meet up with friends. Uh, those are the kind of things that are, are interests of you, then you engage in them. The more you engage, uh, you're able to, again, like I said, have a lot more visual library. Now, just looking at it is maybe not enough, and maybe you have to study from it, right? And the more you draw from those things, that is the gain of that information that you can now hopefully reuse later on. But again, easier said than done. Here's that process. So people always see this. I just want to do this, you know, not realizing in my 20 plus years of drawing from education to professional, there's a lot of this, thousands of hours of this, which most of you wouldn't see. As I post something on Instagram, all I post is that, you know, you're gonna wonder like, oh, what pen did you use? Did you draw from the imagination? How do you do that, you know? Well, it's because again, I'm, I'm, I know how to build forms. I know I built a human figure, you know, and I have a lot of inspiration in mechanical things. Uh, everything is based on that visual inspiration again, you know?
piece you was asking when you were younger, uh, you love to draw, but somehow for some reason this led to classmates thinking that me loving drawing equals to me happily willing to do their hard homework for them. Yeah, that's not fun. This, that's never going to end PCU. People want to come up to you saying, oh, can you draw me for free? You know, <laughs> uh, can I have a tattoo design from you for free? And, you know, you kind of get that pressure. You know, the pressure to perform, the pressure that, hey, you're talented is what they'll say, right? And because it's easier for you, you can do it for me. So the general public doesn't have any concept of the difficulty of the skill that is here. And especially even if you're just beginning, you know, you're, you're building those things. But most common people can't even do this. You know, they can't build form. So for them, when they see someone doing that, that is outside the considered norm, which it is, you're talking about a very small percentage of the population that can do stuff like we're doing, or at least has the interest level to kind of commit to it at a full high degree, um, that they think it's like that, you know? So they think, oh, it's not that much difficulty to ask you to draw me something or do my homework because it's so easy for you. Oh, it's gonna take you like 10 minutes, you know? Where in fact, it could potentially take you hours, you know? Do I get bothered when someone calls me talented? Not anymore. It used to stick to my mind because I don't believe I am talented because I don't necessarily believe in talent at all. Uh, it, it negates the time and effort that I put into this uh, to be able to build a skill to execute to the level that I have. So to say someone that is talented is just to you know, simply say that you have something innately that allows you to do this without any form of training. So they don't see the underlying difficulties and effects. And you know, for, for anybody pursuing art that all of you guys may be, you understand how incredibly difficult it is. And it was difficult for me too, you know? Um, so talent, to me, that's why it never makes sense. Because you're just simply saying that you just have that ability. I would never say to somebody, you're so talented in how you play your guitar. That person probably put hundreds and thousands of hours in being able to play the guitar beautifully. And I'll never be able to do that because I haven't put the thousands of hours into you know, playing guitar. But if I did, it's not about trying to be as good as him, but I would be able to pursue that interest of something that I love to do, right? So you focus on the passions, you focus on the things that make you happy. Not to make others happy, to make yourself happy first. Then you can help others as well in the future. But in a much more cordial, professional manner, <laughs> you know. So I'm gonna go back to some of the questions here. Bruce had asked about uh, some of the new AI programs uh, that everyone seems to be freaking out about, and, uh, or have I, I've covered this quite a bit. And I, I, you know, I don't freak out about the AI art, I understand many young people can because they're afraid of that um, potentiality where that program can come in and take over work and take away jobs from people. But that's not going to happen right now. And if anything else, this is a program to be infused into the process for professionals to use. But, you know, there's a lot of uh, specific nuances of things of discussion that go into this as well, too, from the registration and licensing of the images and what's being taken, what's being used, where things are given credit to, who are, who's getting paid. Uh, people who are not necessarily as skilled taking advantage of these kind of things or the irresponsibility of people to, you know, uh, jump into the market and taking away work, but it over oversaturates it as well, too. So there's a lot of plus and minuses. There are plus and minuses. You can't only say there's only a minus to this, and that's not necessarily very fair, nor a proper way of arguing this thing. You have to be able to see both sides. What is then the potential benefit? And what are the negatives, you know? And if you can't look at both sides, then you're only going to have a biased opinion why this shouldn't exist, you know? And it should not exist. But you're, you can't say that. You know, who are you to say how to dictate the future of technology, right? Uh, no one is. It's just going to go the way it's going to because people are developing new things. And maybe that person didn't do the right thing. But it's not about right and wrong. It's already happened, you know? Now the idea is how do we adapt? How do we use it responsibly? And most times it's not used responsibly many times. But at the same time, I'm not going to sit here, you know, freaking out and wasting time arguing with individuals on something that I don't even use anyways. It doesn't affect my work, but I understand others are. And they will have to fight that fight. I found the things that I've wanted to do, and I found that niche of a direction that I'm, I'm good at. Uh, and what people are going to say, well, what if AI art does what you're doing exactly now? Okay, well, there's a, I'll do it, I'll, that's not going to stop me. How is that going to stop me from doing what I'm still doing, right? Um, again, same thing to others. How does that stop you from keep, keeping creating? But I understand those difficulties and the negative aspects of what's coming up. And, and a lot of them are very much legitimate, you know, uh, questions and arguments to things. And maybe it should be considered to be controlled and not be out there at all. Maybe it's only be turned to professionals, not to the public. I don't know. I have no answers to it. And, you know, it's not to say I don't care, but um, 
it's just one of those cases where I'm not scared of it. That's all it comes down to. And, and that's just how I feel. You know, it doesn't mean that others won't be. It doesn't mean that others can't feel that way. Uh, it's just that how do you yourself personally now need to engage in this, uh, which is to research more maybe, or at least think about it and be open to both sides of opinion, if anything else. Um, if anything, what, what it comes down to me always is to listen to both sides, right? Always, in, in, in many situations. There are some things that, of course, shouldn't in very extreme kind of like, you know, uh, dangerous and life-threatening kind of environments. There is no this or that. You know, you don't, right? So, but in this, technology, right? So, um, anyways. Tico saying, do I scribble? That word also is like the word of uh, talent. I don't use the word scribble because scribbling is doing something without intent. Now, I'm not saying that you can do this. I'm saying personally for me, I don't. Because when I sketch something, when I have an idea of something, usually I have an intent of what I want to try to do. It may not be very good. It may not be the most best or interesting thing, but it allows me to be able to at least have a clear idea of pathway. By scribbling, there is no path. Again, there are many people that can take advantage of this. They like to generate some new stuff and abstract things or unexpected things, spontaneous things. And that can be really cool because maybe you, just, you know, generate a bunch of silhouettes and like, oh, I like that shape. And I'm going to use that to make, make this thing now. That can happen. But I personally don't think that way. Ruma, uh, hopefully very soon. I'm actually trying to finish up the intro to that. I need a little bit of music for my friend Manny. So I want to make an intro to the podcast before I actually even put it up. That's been a little bit of a delay, uh, mainly because of the holiday stuff coming up. Um, Manny had to travel a little bit here and there. Uh, so my friend Manu is, uh, is the guy who's going to help me, you know, who's, he's obviously doing the podcast with me. So, um, and I wanted to get one or two more sessions under the, the, in the can, but I'm hoping very soon, within the next couple of, if not, if not the, this coming week, within the next week or two. Sorry again, that chat disappeared on me. I don't know why it disappears like that. There we go. Okay, okay. Shadow shape here. Throwing some darks. This will help kind of frame the left arm. And creates that inner negative shape right there. And so that way the contrast and the shadow shape helps communicate better as to what's kind of in front, what's in the back. I, I certainly don't mind the questions of things like this, you know, when it comes to people asking, like, oh, did you, you know, talk about AI art, and am I allowed to ask that, and, you know, do I get tired of talking about it? Not necessarily. It's just that I don't really have much to say, you know? I don't think I'm really even the, the right person to even talk to about this, mainly because I really don't have much involvement in it. It seems to affect more digital art people, right? Um, so I don't know. They was asking, uh, before you create a drawing, do you envision it? Uh, I have an idea. An idea. The idea here was creating some kind of like uh, mechanical, cybernetic character that's doing some sort of action and movement. This guy's just running. He's on a run. Initially, we talked about maybe some kind of soldier or some kind of like, you know, mechanized super soldier kind of thing. But it's like, yeah, I've done that many times. But this is not even about generating something cool looking. This is about more of just exercising and practicing and building form. And so a simple motion is more than enough. And right now, people can be also following along, sketching. In the beginning, we kind of did the forms. So stuff like this, visual effects, really help a lot. But it's about making sure the perspective works, right? Which is difficult because we're eyeing the perspective right now. We're not establishing the grid, you know? We're not establishing the horizon. So when you don't really have the ground plane, it can feel a bit floatish. But if you're relatively good at your retaining of the uh, angle of view and the scale change, it usually works fairly well. We're actually going to add a little bit of hatching in this direction now. That gives you a bit of the motion, movement of the leg. <clears throat> I read about this too, Beef Boss. Yeah. Some guy entered a county fair with AI art and won himself 300 bucks. <laughs> Here's the thing about this sometimes, is like, can you really hate the guy? 
if, if someone is able to use a system and, and, and be able to actually successfully do something with it to, to gain, now is it a skillful gain, right? Is it a respectful gain? That's a whole other thing. Maybe not. But it's still a gain nonetheless for someone to be able to actually, you know, use it to perform and to achieve something that obviously people liked, right? You made money. So, um, you know, where, where does that kind of argument go now? Um, again, most people will say, no, it's, it's messed up. You shouldn't do that. And then, of course, there's the other part, which is maybe this person doesn't even know. Maybe he's not even aware of what he's even doing. This is a part of education, right? This is a part of not, you know, having the responsibility aspect of it because they're not aware. That doesn't mean they did it with malicious intent. But if they did, then, of course, that person can and it should be reprimanded for it. Um, how do you do that? Well, that's the problem right now. You can't. But I, I find it a little bit funny, <laughs> honestly. Owen, 14 years old, welcome. Do you have any good art instruction books for students? Uh, the How to Draw book is, someone, is a book I always recommend, right? How to Draw uh, by Marco. Because, you know, it teaches a lot of good things on like composition, framing, building form, um, even things like camera, movement, that kind of stuff. It's a kind of all-in-one book. The How to Draw book from Scott, it's a good book, but I wouldn't necessarily start with that because it's overly too complex and technical. Um, the Framed Ink, Framed Ink book is pretty good. Sorry, okay, that chat window not only just disappears, it doesn't pop back up if I try to click on it. Um, yeah, so as... Uh, Tiri is saying, you know, there was this sense of dishonesty in how we use it. In that part of it, you know, that's where it gets, eh, you know, a little bit, unfortunately, not in the right direction. When someone is trying to be dishonest and trying to, like, slide it as their own thing, not really recognizing that the tool used was that. Like, if you was open by saying, hey, I use this AI art program, and I generated it in these processes and steps, and he was completely transparent about it, I'd feel a little bit differently. But if he was like, oh, no, this is mine, you know, I generated all this stuff, then that's shysty, you know, it doesn't work. And those kind of things should be shut down. Uh, Neff is asking, one thing about shadows I struggle with is if I should make a gradient with a shadow or just make a core shading. Uh, where would you use gradient and where use to use hard edges? Well, that's based on, again, understanding shadow of light, you know, light and, and value. Using observation is really the key thing, right? How to understand where form is turning and where cast shadows are. Usually with hard edges, you know, cast shadows can be isolated towards and soft edges can be used for form shadows. Um, form shadows are, you know, on the cores where things are turning around of a form uh, where edges can be blurred out a little bit, right? Softer. But I just make simple kind of like simple decisions of that. Form shadow, cast shadow. And in this situation, I'm not doing any form shadow. I'm doing primarily just cast shadows. I oh, appreciate that, Ruma. Bruce is saying, you think the whole AI art thing will bring more value to traditional hand-drawn art, uh, which is what I'm doing right now. I, I can see that happening, where people kind of fall back to the traditions of things because they kind of get over, overwhelmed, and also it's oversaturated with the things of digital AI art that people just don't care about anymore because a sense of value of skill is no longer present. Because then everybody is doing it. So you get a flood of information, the visual, things like this. This will eventually probably happen, uh, which is where something like this, which is much more difficult to do, will be more appreciative because you understand the difficulties of those areas. Uh, but I think this is also already kind of happening. You know, for me, where I think AI art really works the best um, is in education. In education, where students are allowed to use that kind of program to assist and help on being able to do things like composition, color, um, shape building, abstractness of images, inspiration, right? Because as a student, you're allowed to explore and to learn. But in terms of anything outside of education, I, wouldn't allow, I don't think I would allow it. So like professional companies, uh, clients should be aware of what those kind of things are. They should be also asking these artists and as transparency what kind of things they're using. 
traditional means, digital means, AI art, whatever the case is, so then they can actually be aware of what these people are doing. But educationally is, is where it should stay because it helps you to, much like a master copy, right? You do a master copy to understand the artist, but you don't use a master copy to apply to a client job. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Like I wouldn't do a copy of, you know, Caravaggio's work, which I've done a master copy of as a student and submit that as like a painting uh, for a company saying, this is my painting. It would never do this. And if you were found out that way, you would be banned, blacklisted. So I think AI art is the approach that way, I think makes way more sense. Stay and stick with it within education. Okay, so we're coming back down to the ending portion of this sketch. We're not going to be going way too much longer. Um, I actually am going to open one more box of basketball cards. I had this one sitting over here. I've been wanting to open this for a bit. Uh, I wanted to sketch a little bit first, just to kind of get things going a little bit. And uh, you guys have observed a little bit now as to like how to build, how to take it to the secondary elements, going into something a bit more finalized. And I could have just done this. But to show you, I'm also capable of being able to explore the ideas of form and turn and, you know, posing and also integrate the combination of things together. Dynamic sketching primarily is mostly this, you know, right here and right here, not this. To get here, you need this. This is actually far more important than anything towards the end. Okay, uh, give me one second. We can still talk. You guys can definitely ask questions. And I'm going to be hanging out and opening a few more sport cards for you guys. Not for you, for me. Because <laughs> I'm doing it for me. These cards I collect. These cards I, I like to have. And so I don't do it for really anyone else. Um, I don't care if the card audience market don't watch these videos. I do it because I enjoy it. But yeah, you guys are welcome to keep asking, talking, that kind of stuff. I expect there to be a bit of a drop-off in terms of attendance, but that can be nice as well, too. Owen's asking, should I be concerned about style when I'm this young, or should I just have the mindset of getting the fundamentals down? Or does it come naturally over time? I mean, you pretty much have the right set of ideas right there. It's just about making the decision and choice, you know? Um, I would say going to the, the directions of fundamentals are far more important than style right now, but it's situational. It really is. Because to say that if you're that young, 14, 17, 20, whatever the case is, to say that you're not allowed to explore style right now is not really the right way to think of it. Because I was exploring style when I was very young. I mean, how could you not, right? What is exploring style? Well, looking at other people's work. By looking at other artists' work, I am naturally picking up on stylistic elements and cues from those people. And as I pick up those elements and cues, I'm also able to integrate it within the things I'm de developing. So initially, I wanted to do comics. And in the world of comics, a style does matter because they, they look for your signature in terms of not signature of handwriting, but a signature of a look that is a DNA of you. And they have a collection of artists, a stable, which from like print specifically is how it works. They have a stable of people and artists they look for, and they're able to allocate them in certain kind of projects. I have this person, this person, and that person, and I have this project. Well, that person right there fits to that project. Well, I have another one coming in, and that person over there fits that one. So an agent or a publisher or a print house can then, you know, kind of coordinate and connect the project to the artist. That's necessary based on the artist's look. So a style can matter in print a lot. In design, it's different. It doesn't matter as much. Uh, Design-wise, it's more about the process of problem solving to apply towards a product, making sure that the elements of uh, visual consistency, world building, you know, functionality elements all work together. And so it builds a very aesthetically pleasing thing, right? And from that, a style can emerge, but you don't start with that. You have style guides. You gather research and all that kind of information. As you're designing it, your style is being integrated as you go through, matching up to the brand's needs, right? What the company wants, not what you want. Hopefully that answers your question, Owen. No Big Boss is saying I'm a novice, and I've been practicing gesture drawing pretty much exclusively since I'm more interested in drawing characters. Should I focus on practicing the more basic shape? Use both. Practice gesture and also practice on um, basic forms because the gesture will give you energy and flow. This is a set of cards called Revolution. This wasn't in the cheap box, so I'm hoping to find some good stuff. This is a 2021 to 2022 year. Only five cards and uh, eight packs. So Maddie's saying style does come naturally, yeah, but it's like building a taste. It's about having, it's, it's like building a taste of food. The more food you eat, you start to hone in on the kind of things you like to taste, right? And so if you were then to make food, you wouldn't have certain uh, kind of things you like to create.
pretty cards here. These are actually really well designed. I like a lot of the shape language. These are the court signs. Hey, Ryan. Sorry for the background noise. Here we have one of the Carver Jr. Uh, I don't know exactly what I'm looking for in here. Uh, probably some rookie cards, uh, numbered cards specifically. But these are all actually really well uh, designed in terms of some of the patterning, uh, some of the prism effects. I like card design also too. I grew up you know, collecting a lot of cards when I was a kid, uh, a lot of baseball cards. I grew up also on marble cards. Uh, this is a rookie. So I was always attracted to the design of the frame and also then of the characters within, specifically like a lot of the marble cards I used to collect. Uh, I would redraw the marble cards over and over and over again. Um, and it was a way for me to kind of build this, you know, as a jaw, uh, skill set, you know, of diversity in poses because trading cards had so many like restrictions in what you can do in that space. So an artist has to be able to problem solve how to use that frame effectively, especially on such a small frame. I'm talking about fit it literally as a small dimension of a card. How do you make the character pop out? So the posing of it always was a kind of fascinating thing as a problem solving. Here's a lamello. I'm gonna put some of the cards aside the ones I want. So this, backwards, uh, this PJ Washington Jr. is an autograph card. So in this box, I think there are a few autographs. PJ is someone I don't really follow. It would be nice to have something I really like, but here's a Steph. It's a nice looking card too. Laser. Sorry, a couple questions. Not a problem, Kat, appreciate that. Uh, someone's asking, do you think they should make artists draw some doodles live in front of judges so they can be sure the artists are not some troll? You know, here's the thing, someone, in terms of that question, we already kind of do this in the industry, which is any designer or artist w wanting to work in, let's say, like Disney or in games or something like this, all those artists will be required to take a test, okay? So they will, you send a portfolio in. Um, as you send the portfolio, the, the HR team or the art director can find your work and say, this person's you know, stuff is really awesome. And so if that position is open, they might call you and say, okay, we, you know, we like your stuff and we wanted to talk to you a little bit. Uh, and of course, before we actually do any sort of like further uh, hiring process, they would have you test. As you test, that gives, you, that, that gives them a clear understanding about your method of process of how you actually did those things. So you have to be able to prove your you know, things that you in your portfolio, basically. Lovely. Jason Tatum. Jeremy Grant right now is on the Blazers. So I feel with a Blazer card. I really like that. Another rookie. I see a ton. Rookie cards put aside. <clears throat> Certain rookies. Well, I guess that's not true necessarily, uh, Saman, in terms of that part. You know, it very much true within the industry of. Um, the game industry and animation, but not so much in art competitions. They wouldn't test you, per se. Well, beef bots, a test is a bit different. You're not, they're not gonna be present to watch you. They give you a couple of days, and, and you have to submit the packaging of all the things you gotta do, right? The design process, the sketching, the research, how you got to the final piece, but there's a restriction on how much time you're given. Derek White, Richard Barrett. Fox, and here's another use of, here's a die cut card of a Zion. I don't think these are numbered though. It'd be nice if they were, but that's kind of what I'm looking for right now, numbered cards. To focus on bettering your skills and to worry about the ability of AI art. You know, that's a good way to put it, honestly. If it doesn't actually, you know, coincide with your uh, directions at the moment, there's no point thinking about it or worrying about it. M there might be a point, in, uh, some time and point in the future you might have to, but I don't think right now is the case. Rudy Gobert, shockwave card from Kaminga. This is not number either. This is a rookie card. 
just three packs. So there's some good ones over there, but again, none of them are numbered. One autograph. Here's a Josh Giddy rookie card that people are collecting at the moment. Conway Clint. The Shockwave. Again, interesting that it's not numbered. Well, once we finish up here with these opening of the last two packs, uh, we'll be wrapping up here very soon. Um, Arthur, you missed the sketch already. <laughs> oh, sports cards never went away last chrono. Do I sell any of these cards? Uh, some of them I grade. I grade them, I send them in because some of them are collectible, they can be rare. And so a lot of them I keep as personal because I like to collect them. Some of them I'd be willing to sell. Base cards, I usually give away. Here's Knife Anthony. Another Zion, which I'll put aside. Any higher profile. Trade up in the third. Last pack. Honestly, I was expecting a little bit more, but it's okay. Another Anthony. Tyler Hero, Andrew Wiggins. Got a double of that already, too. And we have another. Well, this is the um, Anthony Davis. I'm going to go through these and focus in detail later on to kind of, like, look at them closer um, just to see what he got. But I'm going to sleeve some of these over here later on. But anyways, uh, thank you guys for, again, joining in. I appreciate it. If you guys hadn't seen the sketch, for those of you that kind of joined in a little bit late, uh, what we sketched today uh, was this particular piece of building the form. Going to the process of actually detailing it. The final iteration that goes directly into the details. But again, practicing the multi-stage sketching process, get into a habit of it, you know? Uh, drawing whatever you want to draw, animals, people, portraitures, vehicles, uh, doing the initial kind of study of form, understanding this, but which is hard to do because you're not seeing that in front of you. You have to interpret this uh, and then be able to actually cycle it back up into more detail, okay? But into the future, I think this week, I, I don't know if I'll be on again, but I think into next week, uh, once I come back from the holiday stuff, I should be back on again. I might be doing the actual live stream with the uh, Magma Studio, inviting a few people on, and we might do that again next time. But if anything else, again, thank you guys for joining in. Have a good Thanksgiving, and I will see you all later.